Welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you, Ash, for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am so happy that you decided to join me. Um, I'm really excited for this conversation. You are such a subject matter expert and have so much value in your content. And I was just blown away when I met you a couple months ago for the first time. So I'm really excited for people to be able to hear some of the things you're working on and, and the breakthroughs that you found. Um, but before we get into that, as we were you know, talking about what to, or where, what was happening to you the last few weeks, you just had gotten sick with COVID. And part of the rich equation is to talk about, you know, what does it really mean to be rich? And so what I guess want to ask you is, you know, you, you, you were sick for a few weeks. I'm, I'm really glad you've recovered. You look amazing. You know, what, what was going through your head and what have you reflected on in the last few weeks? Oh, that's a great, great question. I'm glad we're just going to go right for the jugular. Um, <laughs> let's just get right to it because I got to tell you, um, I was really surprised, number one, um, to even be in that situation. I I do travel a lot for what I do. Didn't stop the, all that long, but, you know, people kind of view, view me as that completely over the top, blocking everything out. You know, when I'm traveling, I mean, I got like, you know, two face shields, five masks, you know. <laughs> I'm joking, but I mean, I'm like saran wrapped up. I mean, it's so I was really shocked. I mean, in fact, quite frankly, in disbelief. That was I like, nah, no, no, nah, not me, right? My whole family got COVID, and to be honest, I wasn't all that shocked about those guys. <laughs> my husband and my daughter and my son, um, they tend to be a little bit more nonchalant about it, and I'm what some people would call a health fiend. I mean, because I do travel, I make it a point. I mean, I you know, to eat right, to, to do all these things. So not only did I get it, but in my family, I got the worst of it. I was the only one hospitalized. Mm -hmm. And so for those six, seven days, I laid up in that hospital bed. I'm not able to rest because obviously a hospital is no place to go to actually try to get healthy. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, but as I lay there in that hospital bed, I had so many things going through my mind that when I finally emerged and decided that I, 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 can't, I can't be there anymore or else I'm never going to get healthy, I was really sitting there thinking and literally asking myself the question, what is important I mean, to me at least? What should I be doing with my time? Do I go back to business as usual um, or is this experience going to change anything for me? And what I quickly realized, and I'm still kind of going through, because I, I went through these four or five days of just feeling really loopy. Mm -hmm. I called it loopy. But what it really was, was just me in observance of everything that was happening around me, listening to what people were saying, hearing the things that they're complaining about, and recognizing that life really seemed simple to me. Answers seemed simple to me. I'm like, well, it's obvious you you do this. And from that vantage point, I have had like these epiphanies. Um, I have had these moments where I'm like, let's go solve world hunger now. Let's go, let's go ahead. <laughs> let's go fix the planet. I mean, I'm really feeling that way right now. So you're, so you're catching me right now at a very optimistic. I mean, I, I was always optimistic, but this mm -hmm. is, this is next level. This is, this is even surprising me. So that's kind of where I am right now in terms of all of that. I am feeling really grateful to be alive. A lot of people who get hospitalized with COVID don't. I'm feeling really grateful that I'm at this new level of clarity about how to help folks solve problems, especially well, those that I serve in particular. And now I'm just wondering, or not, I won't say wondering, but I, I am kind of questioning to make sure, am I still serving the right people? Because mm -hmm. I've always been very selective about who I use my gifts and talents with so am i still working with the right people am i still making a difference am i still having an impact and am i helping my mission driven because i only work with mission driven companies you know am i really the best still the best person for them and so that's those are the kind of questions that i've been asking myself these past few days since i've been out of the hospital i absolutely love that let me ask you what what do you think showed up that you didn't expect to show up the thing that didn't okay <laughs> And, I, and I'm, I'm going to say it a little bit of a different way than I said it before. I've always sort of been known as being forthright, direct, mm -hmm. expressing what I express. But I've always had this 
this way of tenderizing it a bit. Like, well, maybe that's not the wisest thing you should do. I have had this overwhelming, completely judgmental mindset where I've just been like, God, that is stupid. And then I got to apologize. I mean, you know, my husband has been like, is that the medication or is this like another? But really, I'm like, guys, you do see how ridiculously stupid that is. I've, I want to call things stupid. I don't know why. That's so that's funny. I am right now. <laughs> so maybe in that clarity, you found that you didn't need to be so politically correct or maybe yes i don't want to use the word passive but like you know maybe more sensitive you're like just say it how it is now i'm just saying it and like you know i get it that it's only my opinion but i usually only give it when people ask but that's what that's why i'm like like that's stupid that's stupid oh come on don't don't do that, that, that that's just dumb and i'm saying more things like that lately <laughs> and i'm not apologizing for it and there you go. So yeah, that's super interesting. And and you're right. I don't think that's the Sharon that I've experienced for sure. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. That 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 woman was is is very politically correct. She doesn't want to. She didn't want to offend. And she doesn't. Now I kind of. I don't care. There you go. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I think people need to hear more of that. It's that maybe that's your true authentic self. Maybe that's exactly, maybe that was me awakened. Like, I, I honestly don't care. And if you're offended, I'm not your person. <laughs> well, one of the things, and, and I appreciate you sharing that story, and a lot of people need to hear that, that, that refl- self-reflection time is so important. And, and you know, when you have these major epiphanies in our life, that transition and ask us these major questions about what am I doing and why am I doing what I'm doing and am I serving the right people? I think there's really important to ask those questions and pretty much the thesis of the entire podcast. So I really appreciate you sharing that. But let's get to your subject matter, which I've fallen in love with over the last few months. And, you know, I want to generalize a little bit, but like you really are a strategy expert. And what I mean by that is that you really help organizations, you know, like you said, purpose-driven organizations, find, implement, and execute business strategy for them to take their businesses to the next level. And you've written plenty of books and you've done a ton of research and you've sat on boards. And so like you really have dedicated your work life or career to the strategy ecosystem. And so I think that, I think it's really amazing that you're here. Part of the rich equation, one of the rich equation pillars is income. So I think that it's, we want to make sure that people find as much abundance and wealth and success as they possibly could have in in their life and imagine but we want to make sure that they find harmony and balance and like you said good wealth or good success but let's lean on that for a second because i really want to get people to learn what can they be doing you know very good strong takeaways from today what could they be doing in their businesses to take their companies to the next level so you've developed a what we call the essence of strategy uh, seven steps for enhancing strategic execution i guess talk a little bit about the framework of that and we'll go a little bit deeper sure that was born out of frustration by seeing people invest a lot of money and time into doing what we traditionally call strategic planning and still seeing people stall or downright fail at execution and i knew there was something missing and the answer for me ended up being a huge emphasis on the individuals so it's not just about the strategy but it really is understanding who's thinking of it and who's going to be doing it and marrying all those components together. That's the difference maker. Oh, and then of course, at the heart of it, the essence of it is supporting that individual to go to next level performance. That is key. And when you think about traditional strategic planning, whether it's been for a billion dollar corporation or not for profit, those elements are not the elements that you hear of in those conversations. And if you are hearing it, it's recent in the past you know, several years, it's not traditional at all. In fact, 
I often get asked the question sometimes, are we going to do a strategic plan? I'm like, that's actually what we're doing. Okay. Are we going to do a strategic plan? I mean, I get asked that and I'm just like, guys, listen, your traditional strategic plan maybe got 20 to 30% executed. I'm not here for that. I'm here to have impact and value. So we're going to try a different approach. So that's really at, at the heart of it. I'm looking at marrying business with the individuals and making sure that they're all getting the most that they can get out of it. So does that mean that, you know, we, we're most strategic planning sessions are out of harmony between what the business wants and what the people want? Is that what you mean? I think it's definitely out of harmony about what the business wants and what the people are capable of doing mm. at that time. Okay. It really is. A, it really is a, it's a skill and it's a mindset thing. And we in, well, not we, but typically business doesn't bring along people for the ride. So you end up with even first generation businesses, but definitely second and third generation businesses with employees who have been there for a long, long time. You know, we, we call, let's call them the legacy employees, good people, loyal people believe in the company or at least love the people, but they don't have the skill to really get to that next level and sustain it. And so what I'm talking about doing is simultaneously, while planning execution, we are making sure we're evaluating what skills, what mindset, what dispositions are needed for success and working on that too. Hmm not exclusive of it has to be simultaneous i mean it can't be all about the people okay but it can't be all about the business there must be a synergy between it and it has to be all happening at the same time and most businesses not are not accustomed or equipped to that kind of simultaneous action happening let me ask you a question that i mean i'm i'm wondering this for my business and i know a lot of listeners who have businesses implement different types of strategies, let's say like balance scorecard or EOS or mm -hmm. some other business operational strategic softwares or tools and things like that. I guess in what you're implementing, how, and I guess I have a few questions. Is there such thing as too much strategy? No. Okay. I don't think there's such thing as too much strategy. I think there's a such thing as too much talk about strategy mm -hmm. which can be different okay which which i mean at the end of the day you know i meet a lot of people who don't think that they're involved in strategy you know you're a janitor right i'm not involved in strategy everyone is involved in strategy everyone has been given an objective to accomplish and they decide how they go about accomplishing it it may be so second nature to them that they don't see the strategy but at the end of the day it's strategy and we're always looking to achieve our objectives in a more efficient um, and hopefully a more satisfying manner. That's the difference there. So you never do strategy itself too much because I wonder, if you do it right, it's at the same time. I wonder if people use too many tools, too many softwares, too many strategies because of fear of picking the right strategy. And I know you've developed a really amazing system and a, a tool the seven steps in which i actually want to get a little bit deeper because some of them i've used i still use but like just high level you know what are the trip ups right that most companies deal with like i can imagine having way too many strategies fear of choosing one for for risk of failure or right. fear of looking bad and that oh i said this and that didn't work so i'm not going to go through that strategy and i don't have your filter process like what do you see in everyday type of business Sure. You know, and by too many strategies, maybe I should have uh, qualified that a bit. You can't have too many strategies in the sense that you are spreading yourself too thin, especially if you don't have staff of the mindset and skill to be able to juggle that. Mm -hmm. And most people, most people dependent on, they don't. I mean, they're very, they, they're very singular task focused and things like that. So in that sense, yes, you can have too many, but not in the sense that we're always trying to figure out how to do what we do better. Hopefully, if your mission, right. if your mission is driven, you definitely are trying to do yourself better. So people do pick tools. I mean, and, and there are a lot of them. I won't, you know, name one specifically, but I think their expectation going in 
is that many of these tools are going to help me be more strategic, but I don't think many of the tools that at least that we've mentioned are strategic. They're, they're great operational tools, mm. but there's a, but that's, but there's a difference right. between operational versus strategic. And I think that's where some of the confusion, I mean, I can think of one in particular that's quite popular in our, in our circle and it's kind of billed as being strategic and it's anything but. It's a great operational tool, but it is not something that helps you be more strategic. What do you see as the number one, one or two things that leaders should be doing today when it comes to developing their strategy or communicating their strategy to their organizations? Sure. I would say that the, the number one thing is having absolute clarity and a, and a compelling presentation of their mission. Mission gets overlooked a lot. And I think it's at the heart of having a heart about why people show up and bring their A game every single day, not just when they feel like it. So mission for me is critical. But the next thing is absolute vision. If you don't have a vision, what are we strategically planning for? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I mean clear cut, where are we going with this? Is it, because if you don't have a, a, a clear vision that's helping you disseminate that mission, at some point, it really is for you, whether you say it or not, it's about money. I mean, what is it that we're actually doing here? And if you can't answer that question in a, in a, in a persuasive and compelling way, what, then what, this is just a job for your people. And I want to get into the handbook for a minute, but like, what if that is the answer? What if it is, you know, I just want to do it for the money. Sharon, mm -hmm. stop asking me all these strategic questions. You're asking me too many details. I just want to make more money. What is your advice to those people or what actually ends up happening when you experience well, those types of leaders? Yeah, um, everybody is entitled to their own desires. I'm not your person. Right. I don't even have conversations. I don't anymore. I don't have conversations with business owners if that's their only focus. I just don't. I'm here to, I, I want to be significant and I want to have an impact. Money can help you do that, but I can guarantee you it is not the driving force that will make people show up and bring their A game every day consistently. So I was being a little I'm not facetious. Person, so I'm, I'm not the best person to answer that question. I was being a little facetious because I, I don't I, know I don't experience too many leaders nowadays that can even survive with that mindset, right? No. It's quite no. difficult. So one of the things you asked us to do in in your workshop was to determine you know, there's, there's a handful of steps that you like us to go through, but one of them was a before and after of what do you think the, what do you think the main fir first five strategies actually are? So I'll tell you that your work is so powerful because just as I look at this to see the dramatic difference between what I think the strategy is to what it actually ends up being. And I'll read it for people so that they can really see, and then we'll dig into the process. But what I thought that the things I needed to focus on were the following. And I think I did this like maybe 60 to 90 days ago, right? Over communication to my customers and my employees, having a very clear marketing message. I needed to have more feet on the ground. I needed to get focused on my delivery metrics, shipping on time data points, KPIs. And then I needed to have clear process, transparency, and project management. So those are, there's some like really tactical, uh, specific things that I needed, felt like I needed to do. Now, what was really fun is if you see my after, it really speaks to what you're talking about. So we talked about collaboration at the leadership level. So like better collaboration, clarity on what I want a visual representation to communicate what I want, develop a flawless execution strategy and carve out time to carve out like individual quiet time. Those were the things I felt like I needed to do. So you can see that there's such a drastic difference between being what I thought was strat strategic, which is probably much more tactical yes. and being strategic, which is well, what are the things I really need to focus on that will create a bunch of impact downflow, right? Downstream. Yeah. So I just thought I'd read that for people to see the dichotomy of when you do some of the work that we're about to talk about, you get this really amazing clarity about what strategy you really need to implement. And one of the things, and we can talk, you know, we can go wherever you want, but one of the filters you had talked about 
which completely blew my mind was, and, and let me step back. You have seven filters and each of them are testing your, testing your strategy, whether or not that strategy is legitimate or not, or whether it has, it needs to be filtered or more clear or has bias, but the test for bias blew me away. Can you talk a little bit about this? Sure. You know, I think biases are, I'm sorry, unconscious biases. Let me say that. Yes. Because we all have them. We all have them. And some of us like our biases. I have a few that I like and um, probably wouldn't change. But most people are unaware of the biases they bring to the table. And more importantly, they're unaware of their impact. Impact not just on the decision, but on the consequences or results of those decisions, which means they're never looking for those impacts. Once you're aware of the fact that you have a bias and you make a conscious decision to either go with it or neutralize it, there's this part of your brain that either unconsciously is looking for the impacts or you are formal about it, as I suggested, and regularly, routinely say, okay, guys, what are we experiencing here? What kind of impact is our decision? I mean, let's just say it's like the decision to not hire anyone with visible tattoos. What has really been the impact of that? Did we see our recruiting numbers go up, go down? Did we see the quality of them go up or go? What are we actually experiencing? Because somewhere in our mind, there's a relationship between not having visible tattoos and the success we desire. We get to confront that once we're aware of it. And so I have a very formal and intentional um, method to make sure we are not only going through those, but we're documenting them so we can learn from them and grow from them. Well, one of the things that really slapped me in the face about this is that as leaders, either as executives in a business or leaders of teams, there is so much bias, framing bias, anchoring bias, self-interest bias, confirmation bias that mm -hmm. we're operating on a daily basis with. And the way we communicate, our positions give us this bias, our ability to walk into a room and not feel challenged gives us this bias, right. like, right? What advice do you have for people that that, that can maybe improve their awareness of where their biases or how their impact of, of language or, or presentation shows up within their team and could affect their bias. Like what, what are the, what are some tools that we could all use to be more sensitive about this? Yeah. You know, one of the best questions I think you can ask yourself simply is, um, why do I believe that's true? Why do I believe that that result is what's likely to happen? Mm-hmm. And once you force yourself to honestly answer that question, explore it a bit. You know, what's the basis for that for me? My experience only? What have I seen happen? Because I've seen it happen to my mother, my father, my parents, my family or something. I now believe that that's just the way the world works. And if I believe that, I'm gonna write that down. I believe X, Y, and Z is going to be true. Now, every meeting we have on the strategy, I want to come back to the team and say, okay, I or we believe this was true. What's confronting that? If, what are we experiencing that's validating or invalidating that? And the more our beliefs and our biases are invalidated, at some point, if, if you're rational, I guess, <laughs> you do have a reckoning moment where like, you know what? Why don't I at least try? Let me try something different. And then you go, you basically, you're on a path towards change, but that change never comes about as long as these biases remain unconscious. You have this like natural curiosity about yourself and, and you can just tell in the way you operate and the way you ask questions and you manage, you know, you manage our group or you manage this conversation. You have this, like, I don't care if I'm right, as long as I get to the truth, where does that come from? For you you know that's, a, uh, that, that's another great question ash because i don't i can't say that i believe we're born with it <laughs> but i can say i've operated with it as far as long as i can remember i've just always wanted to know why mm -hmm. why I've, I've always wanted to know okay there's fact and then there's truth okay 
and which one is in operation for me right now and how do I know how do I learn to be able to more quickly discern the facts from the truth in any given moment and operate in that way I guess what you what just showed up for me is do you you get more satisfaction in proving other people wrong than proving yourself right oh absolutely absolutely <laughs> because people who are true learners mm -hmm. learn more when they're wrong than they do when they're right isn't there's this old proverb that says smooth was it smooth seas do not make skillful sailors we don't become better leaders because we're always right uh -huh. because things are operating smoothly. That's not what makes us better or stronger, ready for something like a pandemic, okay? No, it's the hard times, it's the challenging times. It's the times where we had to painstakingly go through something and understand it. That's what made us strong. So yeah, I love challenging questions. I love, and I only work with the CEOs who want me to do that. I mean, I have one, I'm thinking of, he loves, poke holes until I cry and he loves it because when he walks out of our sessions and walks out of there he he knows he's more ready I mean you're never a hundred percent right or never a hundred percent ready but you're more ready mm -hmm. and the more this becomes a habit the more effective leader you become so good what is let's see what else do I want to ask you what are what do you see are the major trends that are changing in business strategy today or in the way that people process business strategy given technology, given COVID, given the almost the the way that employees and employers engage with each other? Are you seeing major trends that are shifting over your over your career based on what's happening well, today? I'm going to say, uh, let's just let's take this COVID period. I've experienced working with some, I, I, I don't often work with the entire leadership team per se, it's usually the executive team, but there's a couple that I do. And I remember at the start of COVID, how grateful people felt to have a job, still be working, mm -hmm. still be getting an income. And within a year, I felt a total shift of all of that not being grateful to have a job but i don't want to say entitled but like i'll get a better job i mean you know that i and i, I don't think we're ever going back to that to that old mindset in in that way this is why i think the whole notion of being mission driven and vision focused is so critical because you have to tap into so much more as an employer than you ever had to in the past to really have engaged high performing people do what they do consistently. So I, I would probably say if, if there's a trend for anything, I would say it's the investment that's required mm -hmm. to keep people optimally engaged. Yeah, and that's not just in strategy, but it's oh no, it's in no. how we invest in our people, how we how, training and education and and personal time and yep. the attaboys and all of that. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, such an interesting time. I, you know, I've been, I've seen such a dramatic change over the last 10, 12 years. We started our business in two thousand eight. And just the the ebbs and flows of culture and the way people think and what they need and I mean really right now is a really different time. Yes, for sure, for sure. I mean, even, I mean, we've I mean, you you probably heard it said you know way too much now that it's almost probably growing numb on us about you know no one saw COVID coming we couldn't have anticipated you know 18 months into this now. I really feel like most of the people at least that I get to interact with, they have adapted as best as they're ever going to have adapted. Sure. They, they've, they've settled into what's now the current new norm and are navigating their way out. But I'll tell you the ones that I think did it the quickest are the ones that never strayed from the need to think strategically and make sure their people were at the same time. 
even when there was a lull in business, I had several clients that were saying, hey, Sharon, you know, we have time, people are home. Why don't we do some more of those strategic thinking exercises? What can we do to really develop their thinking so we can ultimately improve leadership? So this is nothing from, I mean, I'm not saying anything against the companies that were really struggling out there, but I knew several of several companies that were struggling as well, but chose to say we're struggling, but there has to be an end. I mean, either we won't exist and none of this will matter, or we will exist and be sorry we didn't do any of this kind of work. And they're in such a much stronger place right now. Yeah, I'm in this season of my life where like question everything, right? And one of the things we just started this podcast was with, is you know, you were you were in bed for a week, like questioning, like why am I doing yes. what I'm doing and where am I doing? Oh so I think that the benefit of COVID was at least for me, and I know I've stimulated a lot of these conversations within our group is, why are we doing what we're doing? Are we doing the right thing? You know, the whole idea of showing up to work five days a week, I think was a program for me. Like I never thought that that was even a question that that's how you run team, how you run an organization. I would have that never questioned it. It was, done. it was just the way it was done. And I think that I got a lot of benefit from thinking outside the box and realizing, you know what, I can find some flexibility here. Mm -hmm. It, you know, you start to question why are we doing what we're doing? Am I having enough meaningful time with my family and finding your why? And is that strong enough? And is it aligned with what you're doing at work? Like, I think all those questions are very prevalent today. And I think they are justified to be here. But the question is, is how do organizations adapt to that environment, right? And how well, the can thing we? Is, I, I think as one of the key principles here is it wasn't all that long ago. I mean, I don't think I'm all that old, but it wasn't all that long ago where even asking questions like this was like foo foo, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, you know, where's the where's the bottom line tangible return? Um, now, if we're not asking these kind of questions, how do we be competitive? I mean, that's another, I mean, that's, that's what, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Right. Huge and, shift. And, it's, it's huge exactly and it's huge and you do still have some holdouts who don't get it who who don't understand it who's like look i provide a i provide a check that gets cashed for you i mean there's still a lot a lot of people so i think you and i have um have to be on guard mm -hmm. because we do hang out in crowds that think this way and it seems natural but that's not typical mm -hmm. it's not typical at all so we can totally miss that point and think that oh isn't this what everyone no no they really really don't well entrepreneurs and business people always have to solve the problem right like they're gonna have to figure it out they're gonna have to solve the problem they're gonna now have to figure out how do we build great culture and mission-driven organizations as well as have this incredible culture and drive business and strategy do remotely, and right. do it remotely, do it remotely. And, and have a healthy EBITDA. Like you have to be able to do all of it. And, and the burden is really on the entrepreneurs. It really is. It really, and right. You have to be able to do all of it. You cannot anymore be a one, two or three trick pony. If you are going to be competitive and prosper continuously, you're going to have to do it or you're going to have to pay a lot of money to a bunch of other people <laughs> to do it. And that's never a, a, a long term great solution necessarily either. Well, 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 depending on the business model. What advice do you find yourself giving the most? Taking time to understand vision. I think I say that. I, don't, I won't say once a day because <laughs> I don't talk to a lot of new people once a day, but almost every time I'm engaging with people who don't know me and I don't know them as well. Vision. Vision. Vision to me is everything now. Um, I mean, it's been part of my protocol for the past, I say, 16 years, but it's catching on a lot more now. People are thinking about it more as more people talk about it, but it is vision. It is vision because, again, what are we strategically planning for if we don't even know where we're going? What do you wish you knew 20 years ago? All the well, that's, that's that's really really easy. For me. Number one, number one, hands down. I wish twenty. Okay, well, let's go thirty because twenty years ago, love it. I didn't let's go thirty. <laughs> right, let's go thirty. Twenty years ago, I, I didn't know this, but health, being healthy, is rhetoric that a lot of people give. Mm. But what does it really mean to not only be healthy? What will it take? 
and in, at least here in America for sure, what are you going to have to sacrifice to make all of that happen? And I wish I had been more definitely more secure in who I am in those social in those social social situations to stick to my guns. Cuz we're quick to say, "Oh, that's a little bit, it won't hurt." But when you're doing a little bit every hour or every day, it all adds up. Um, and I went through a period about 20, a little over 20 years ago. That's why I say I, I got this message 20 years ago <laughs> where I was, you know, fatigued, tired all the time. I didn't realize I was in a mental fog. Um, I didn't know until I came out and I was like, oh my, wow, look at this. Um, but yeah, I, I really wish at a younger age that I not only gave, I mean, uh, lip service to, but that I understood and actually practiced what it meant to live in a healthy way. So, emotionally and physically so that's what that's the number one thing i wish everyone on this podcast is also listening trying to find that perfect harmony for themselves and i think it is a little different for everybody's body and their own chemistry but what are two or three thing quick takeaways that you know like i do this on a routine i do this consistently yeah, and this works yeah. for me and, and it it improves your health and vitality well, before I say that, I'm just going to, I'll say this too. And this is one of those things that, you know, I guess I don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's okay to be controversial. That's why we're here. But, but you know, the truth is people want different, but they don't want to be different. I hear a lot of people, I've, I've, I'm, I'm around some folks who literally cry about their desire to be healthier, to be in better shape because they're tired. They can't be with their kids the way that they want to be. I hear it. I see it and none of their habits actually change. And, and when I say I have friends, I mean, none, 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 none actually change. So I think that's number one. You're gonna have to come to grips with yourself and be honest. Is this something you really want or is it just something you entertain yourself with in thinking? A fantasy land. So that way you can at least stop being frustrated about it. because if it's not a goal, it's not a goal. It's not a priority, it's not a priority. Own that at least for now. And maybe some of the stress and, and self-hate that they experience all the time can dissipate. But having said that now, the number one thing I would say, if, if we got rid of sugar and simple carb type products that turn easily to sugar, the transformation in health in our, I believe in our country would, would be, leave us speechless. Mm -hmm. And then of course, we have all the crazy chemicals to preserve things and that our bodies don't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. So many of us wrap it in fat and accumulate fat because <laughs> your body's trying to like, I don't know what to do with it. Let's hide it. Let's keep it. Let's keep it from affecting us. So it's, it's, all, all of these things are just outrageous and most of it is common sense we won't drink water we'll go drink some soft drink oh but it doesn't have sugar it has something it's it's crazy it's little it's just crazy what we do and we call that enjoying we give kids candy and we call it a treat there's just these mindsets out there that just defies the very thing that we say we want but we call it living and having a life. That's one of those moments where there's a difference between fact, you may be alive, but the truth is you're not really living. Mm, so powerful. I mean, you know, again, we'll talk about this, but like the pills of the rich equation is, it doesn't matter how much money you're making, but if you're physically bankrupt, emotionally bankrupt, you have no energy to enjoy your life, you're not aware mm -hmm. of your behaviors, like what's the point? So uh, I'm really yeah. glad we touched on that. And we could probably do an entire episode. Oh, we absolutely could do we, that. We could absolutely do an episode. Time. And I know you you are deep into this health stuff, especially with, you know, your kids and stuff. But it's, mm -hmm. it's such a powerful, important topic. And, you know, my belief is that I think people, people want those things, but they're, it's easy to talk about and complain about it because it makes you feel safe. It makes you feel like you're trying something, you're doing something by just talking about it. And, and then like you said, you know, being in social circumstances and maybe having a cocktail or having that extra, that junk food or what have you, it's super easy and it's only almost socially obligated in a lot of settings, right? Exactly. Exactly. That's what I experienced. Yeah. I mean, back in the early days of starting the on um, the first business I had, I was, you know, out all the time, meeting with 
potential clients and not wanting to be offensive. I mean, they're gobbling down this and I take a little piece and be like, but I'd be screaming like, I don't really want this, but I don't want to be ostracized. I don't want to be thought of as, you know, not being a team player and all these things. I found myself doing more things to make other people feel better than myself. Uh-huh. feel better and, and, and in hindsight I, it really wasn't about making them feel better it was about making sure that I didn't feel like I was missing out that's right on on whatever opportunity or connection I thought that they can give and the more I freed myself from that I realized that there's nothing that feels better than feeling better and the more I became addicted to having energy the more I became addicted to the things that enable me to have a fulfilling life the less I cared about what other people think. And in fact, I had a client once, oh, well, I'm sorry, not a client, a potential client tell me, you know, Sharon, I don't trust anybody who won't have a drink. You won't have a drink, I can't trust you. And I was like, well, thank you for saying that because you just saved me a lot of time and money because I don't trust anybody who thinks is living to, to, to just totally destroy their liver and then want to complain about how the healthcare system is failing. Right. And I got up and I walked out literally at the lunch table and felt phenomenal about it. And actually, we're actually so good friends with that, <laughs> with that person. We didn't do business, couldn't do business together, but we're actually still friends to this day. One of, one of the things that comes up for me is when you're saying all of that, and whether it's in business or in social settings or when it comes to what we put in our bodies is so much of what we do is about conforming to what other people will expect us to do mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. what do our customers expect us to do what do our employees expect us to do what does our society expect us to do and i almost like the idea of like if you're doing something that people are surprised about you're probably on the right path Absolutely. If, if people are that. if people are questioning like why is she doing why is she behaving that way why is she doing something that I don't expect, you're probably on the right path. Absolutely. You know, I'll say, I think it's a fear of being excluded. Absolutely. Um, It's a fear of being excluded. Everyone's looking for their tribe. They want to be accepted and they want to be loved. You know, they want to be included. And I think our children more so than ever. I mean, I think if our generation had issues with it, 10 exit for them because we didn't give them any sense of self, self-esteem and self-worth in that way. And so, yeah, we're sitting up here trying to please others in an effort to be included. And I think everyone loses. Mm-hmm. Everyone loses because we're not happy because oh, I'm tired. I got to go to bed. I got to wake up and drink 10 pots of coffee to feel like I can actually make this day happen. And, and I think we even become a little resentful. You're right. Resentful with ourselves for succumbing and not being strong enough, but resentful of being around people that can't appreciate the effort it takes. And it takes effort to go against the grain here, especially in America, who who can appreciate the effort it takes to 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 to, to buck the system and try and be healthy. Sharon, what is what is being rich mean to you? Well, rich to me is just having a lot of money <laughs> in terms of money. So that's the financial area of my, uh, of my having money. You know, wealth is having money work for you. Rich is just having a lot of it for me. But if we're going to talk of, you know, extrapolate the concept of rich to other areas of our life, you know, it's having people in your life who appreciate you. Now, some of us could stand to work on ourselves because some of us can be annoying because we haven't learned how to hone that in and, 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 and not be so selfish with our expression. But the truth is, that's I think that's rich to have people who just love you, who, who admire you, who when you're around them, they feel like the world is a better place because you're there. That's in relationships, you know, prospering in our business. As a Christian, I'm a I'm a tither and I'm a, and I give a lot of offerings. I really believe not only am I here to do that, but I've never tithed and given an offering where I didn't see it come back to me in all kind of ways. So I want to prosper so that I can prosper in the things that I think help 
um, disseminate the word of God in that way. That to me is rich. Being able to just, if I want, go home and spend time with my children or pull them out of school and take them on a trip with me on one of my business trips and just know everything is okay in doing that, that's rich. So being able to spend time with my husband who Sunday, we just had our anniversary, 29 years. Mm, congratulations. Yay. Yeah, thank you. You know, just being able to sit with him and look into his eyes for as long as I want. That's rich. So those are just some examples Oof. of what used to need to be rich. So good. I mean, thank, well, firstly, thank you so much for your time. Yes. Thank you for being open and vulnerable and sharing your message with people. I think we, we probably could have taken another hour and maybe we'll schedule another episode to talk about some of this other stuff. But I just really appreciate you speaking from the heart and sharing what's going on with you. You have so much value to give to the world and keep doing what you're doing. And hopefully, you know, the, the, the universe keeps giving you energy to keep sharing your message. How do people find you? How do they, you know, if they want to get in contact with you? Sure. My website is Sharin.com. S-H-E-R-R-I-N.com. So you can always see something there or connect with me on a forum through there or connect with me on LinkedIn, Sharon Ingram on LinkedIn. So. Great. Well, we'll put all the links in the show notes and, and all that kind of stuff. So listen, thank you so much again and hope you have a great day. Thank you much so much for the listeners. We'll talk soon. Bye, Ash. Thank you.